Uh, okay everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the uh, short-ish, I guess mid-range, sort of eight-game slate that we've got here on um, Wednesday, uh, July 19. Um, not going to put out anything for the earlier. I think, uh, you know, Sheets and Bobby, will, they'll be live here shortly um and go over the early uh, we do of course have projections and and ownership loaded for the early to both true dfs and sabersim for those with the uh, sabersim add-on um feel free to you know keep an eye out for updates etc etc uh as we get into lock here in a few hours um now as far as the main slate goes man it did a pretty high score at night last night eh uh kind of ridiculous um you know we talked about that a little bit right that the projections were sort of hinting to us that with a f whatever it was um you know 14 games on the on the day when we didn't have a single arm projecting north of 18 points in the early runs um that it was likely to be a, a pretty high scoring night and sure enough uh, there was offense all over the place. So um, you basically just had to land uh, like any number of teams could have gotten you there, right? The Cubs put up 17. Um, obviously, the really big game where everybody was hitting the ball out of yard was Arizona and Atlanta. Um, you know, but there, but there were plenty of spots that you could have gotten to last night. Really, it was a difficult night on the mound, um, but... If your offense got there for you, um, that really, you know, you could have cashed a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of builds, um, you know, with some subpar arms because there was only what I think three guys that really went off. That was Musgrove, Patty Sandoval, two guys that, you know, unfortunately I wasn't on too heavily, um, and uh, maybe one more I forget who it was. In any case, uh, we do not have that same dynamic here today. We've got some good arms once again going um, in, you know, some still pretty bad matchups, I would say. Um, but the projections for them are far higher. So what I think that should tell us, right, is that constructions today, we sh don't necessarily have to focus solely on offense. And we should probably consider pitching a little bit more. Um, that said... You know, the, this is a, a shorter sort of mid-range eight-game eight, eight game slate, right? And we got some pretty hefty ownership figures coming to these guys that are projecting well. However, they're all in pretty bad matchups, right? You got a lot of ownership, 25% coming to Charlie Morton here. He gets Arizona. It's not like their offense is any worse than it was yesterday. Um, Charlie Morton, obviously, a little bit better. Luis Castillo has been pretty dreadful over his last eight starts, at least for DFS purposes. Um He's seeing 40% ownership right now. He gets Minnesota. It's a great matchup, but, you know, we'll, we'll get into perhaps why this might be a little bit aggressive here. Eddie Rodriguez, really good matchup against the Royals, who took apart Tarek Skuba last night. Um, Justin Verlander, who can't throw strike one this season, gets the White Sox, who jumped on, uh, I forget whoever they, uh, it was a Cookie last night, right? Um, well, I mean, Verlander is naturally better than Cookie, but, I mean, is he? Uh, we'll get into it. Carlos Rodon in his third start, seeing a lot of ownership here in an okay matchup, but perhaps uh, some exploitable edges that we could find here in the ownership figures, at least in the early runs. You've got Josie Berrios against San Diego. It's a fine matchup. Uh, you Darvish on the other side of that game, not necessarily a fine matchup, but both of these guys certainly have 25 and 30 in the tank. And they're at very playable price tags. Could use them as an SP2 or even anchor with these guys in, in some tournament builds here today. So um, that said, that's kind of a, a brief sort of gut reaction look. I once again want to stay off of most of the guys down here in the uh, lower ends of the pricing spectrum, as we do usually. But today, if we're going to have to or want to get up to some of these more expensive guys at high ownership, we might actually well enough consider uh, getting to some cheaper guys down here, like a, I don't know, a Tukey Toussaint. Um, don't really want to be playing Trevor Williams, Ross Stripling, or anything like that. Um, you know, I mean, 
you really don't want to be playing any of these guys with such low median projections. But we might have to make some decisions here because we got just eight games and a lot of ownership coming to the top arms here. So we're going to have to make some decisions somewhere in order to get different. So that said, uh, spiel aside, we do have projections and ownership loaded as usual. Uh, so let's just get into the game. San, San Diego, Toronto. Here's Darvish at 8,000. I love the price tag here for Darvish. I don't like to strike one necessarily, but I've talked about with this with Darvish uh, several times this season. He throws so many damn pitches that we can get away with a slightly below average or slightly below elite tier strike one rate with Darvish in particular. Um, he mains the slider mostly, right? But he throws so much garbage here that it's really kind of understandable, you know, not that it's equitable or anything, but understandable for sure that he gets behind some hitters sometimes. Uh, he's not getting behind a majority of the hitters, right? But sub 60% strike one rate is always a notable figure. Uh, but with Darvish in particular, he's really balanced in the six pitches that he does use, he even mixes in a seventh with a change up here, right? So throwing all kinds of stuff. And for the most part, it's pretty okay. He doesn't use the changeup enough to really get beat up by it, right? Giving up three and a half outs to the field. Well, whatever. He's only throwing it 1% of the time. It's the four-seamer of the fastball mix, at least, that really uh, gets him taken apart here. But overall, the fastball mix getting roughly neutral value on it uh, with the four-seamer, two-seamer cutter. Pretty equitable split here, 40 three percent of the arsenal give or take it's the split and the you know, break-even slider that he's maining here that are, are really giving him um stabilization value if you will and then he's getting a lot of the swing and miss certainly to the left side of the plate with the curveball it's of course coming from the split too so overall i i think the arsenal from darvish is just it's fine, right? It's uh, it's still respectable. He still doesn't walk a lot of guys, despite this lower, slightly depressed strike one rate. And he stays off of the barrel. Does get ground balls, which always keeps Darvish in play. Um, what we're really concerned with with him when we click in a ton of Darvish is just the lack of a strikeout rate to same-handed hitters. And um, that's a little bit worrisome, right, with how much he's throwing this slider. It's just not a whiff pitch for him necessarily. But... With still a 29% CSW, he's getting so many called strikes, that's where most of that's coming from. Um, since he's throwing so many pitches, he doesn't really need a 13 14% swinging strike rate anymore if the called strike rate is this high. It still keeps the CSW up near 30%, and strikes are strikes, so we don't really care for the most part. Um so I think that he is serviceable, certainly at a depressed price tag. Uh, he hasn't been overly, um, I guess, useful for us in DFS this season. You know, for the most part, mostly just middling. His last 10 starts or so have really not been good. He's only popped for, um, what, four really excellent outings the entire season. And three of them have been in really, really good matchups. Uh, one against Milwaukee, one in his last outing against Philadelphia, who strikes out a crap load. Another against the Cubs, who also does strike out. And kind of a surprising outing in early May against the Dodgers, where he went about six and two-thirds, only gave up one run, but did strike out a K in inning. Uh, got a win out of that, so perhaps a little bit inflated there. But the strikeout stuff has really only been there for him in a handful of starts. Outside of that, it's mostly hovering around a K in inning, despite the kind of suspiciously high 26% aggregate K rate, it is just 21% to the right-handers. And that's kind of what would uh, make me pause here, certainly against Toronto, right? They don't strike out a lot against right-handed pitching. We talked about this yesterday with, um, with Joe Musgrove. However, he took them apart, went seven, struck out nine or something. Um, they will do this on occasion with guys that are streaking to the upside, and Musgrove is certainly one of them. You Darvish, perhaps not one of them, and streaking to the upside. Uh, really still struggling to find it a little bit um, and really find a lot of the upside. So at the price tag, I think he's got to be in play at 8000 here. I do like the ownership. Like I said, we can get to some balanced teams and balanced builds here. And if you Darvish at 8000 with a 43-pitch you know, repertoire here um, 
is going to help us get contrarian a little bit. I think that's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm fine with a, a 25 value score in an eight-game slate. He still has 25 and 30 in the tank. It's just that it hasn't been all that regular this season. Still looking for a little bit of positive regression in the strand rate for Darvish here, of course. Um, and certainly in the raw suppression metrics, got a 460 ERA with a 380 XFIP. So perhaps a little bit more coming to him in that respect. 233 XBA, he's given up a little bit more realized average than that. Same thing with the X Woba, 298, given up and then, you know, roughly average 315 or so there. In the power suppression, he's given up a 171 ISO when he's only got a 135 X ISO, right? At a 26% K rate, the ground balls and a 33% hard contact are all palatable here. So I, I think Darvish is very much in play against Tor Toronto. I don't really like playing um, certainly guys with low strikeout rates against right-handers um, against Toronto, right? That's uh, a little worrisome. He is given up still this season in 160 hitters, 195 ISO. So, you know, we got to note this, of course. Um, but overall, at uh, a cheap price tag and, and depressed ownership, I think Darvish kind of has to be in play. Toronto, I don't really want to play them once again. They're uh, they're difficult to... You know, I, I like stacking Toronto, uh, obviously, against bad arms. And Darvish is really not that. I respect the arsenal still. And it's very difficult to navigate seven freaking pitches. So uh, overall... Um, I think Toronto is, is kind of off of the board for me today. They're still at their normal price tags, and Darvish is a, still a well above average arm. So uh, I think I'd probably have to side with him here. Josie Barrios on the mound for the Jays, 8,200. I think he's very much in play as well. I really like this ownership here at 6,000 or 6,000, 6%. 6 um, he's far more efficient. I mean, 6% in. Uh, strike one rate is 6%. You can't really fake that. He doesn't walk anybody either. Barrel rate at 8%. This is a fine number. In aggregate, the strikeout stuff is a little bit lower. His stuff is kind of outsized a little bit to the left-handers here. It's, you know, change up slider a little bit. Of course, the two-seamer that he's made for most of his career, not a swing and miss pitch, has flipped a little bit of the usage over to the four-seamer here. So he's a, quite a bit more balanced in the arsenal. Uh, still throwing the slider a lot. That has been historically is a big swing and miss pitch against righties. But the strikeout stuff to the right side has really kind of disappeared. That would obviously be what takes me off of outsized exposures of, of Barrios here. But we don't really need to get too crazy when he's only, you know, 5, 6, 8 percent owned uh, in tournaments. So I think he's very much in play at 8,200 as well. I, I think getting to pitching here in this game um, is... Certainly respectable. Do I want to go after offense? Not particularly, but it's kind of similar to yesterday in that, um, you know, well, I really wanted to get to the Padres, right? And they took apart Alec Manoa, who walked a whole country again. I don't th really think we're going to see that here necessarily tonight. These guys have good control, and Barrios this season in particular has really solved a lot of the issues that were plaguing him last year. He's getting ground balls as well, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult for these guys to lift a baseball really on both sides. And for the most part, these offenses are pretty similar. I would side with um, Barrios as a matter of fact, because I think I, I obviously respect Toronto's offense against right-handers far more than I do the Padres offense. And it's mostly because of the just raw batting average Delta here, you know, batting average is kind of a, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a fishy metric, I, I suppose for lack of a more, um, <laughs> crass way to say it. Uh, at, at 227 here, we don't really want to use batting average, right? We want to use the, the more uh, advanced metrics like a, a WOBA and OPS, far more descriptive uh, for DFS purposes. Obviously, we use the ISO and the hard contact rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But sometimes we don't really, uh, you know, we can't really ignore. Uh, some of this, the simple metrics like raw batting average and Toronto hits a 261. This is a pretty big figure here against right-handers, whereas the Padres hit for just 227. This is a pretty poor figure. Now, despite the fact that they walk a lot, we talked about this yesterday a little bit as well. Most of this is coming from Soto. Um, however, you know, this is still a, a pretty good and dangerous offense. So um, outside of, you know, like guys like a Tatis, maybe a Hassan Kim on occasion, they're not going to steal bases up here. And not going to really create a lot of offense, maybe Soto a little bit. So I think I have to side with Barrios a, a little in this respect. I'm not super worried about that high 
walk rate for the Padres because, once again, Barrios is not going to walk a lot of guys. So, uh, overall, I think the arsenal here is fine. Uh, a pretty equitable split, four-seamer, two-seamer slider change. And uh, it's basically break-even. I think this is a slightly above break-even matchup for Barrio. So I've got no problem getting to him at very low ownership. If the ownership steams and flips to like 15% or something, then, you know, we, we probably pumped brakes a little bit on both of these guys. But um, for the most part, at the moment, I think the price tags and, you know, combined with the ownership, put them in play in what are admittedly subpar matchups. But, um, you know, I think the ownership and, and the price tag considerations have to sort of put them in play for us. So I'm, o- I'm okay getting to pitching here. Uh, less on offense, but you can always play both of these offenses. It is only an eight-game slate, and these guys do still have their weaknesses, right? Darvish giving it up to the right-handers. Barrios still a little bit of pop allowed uh, to the left-handers. So, uh, you know, don't ignore a Juan Soto or Jake Cronenworth or anything at playable price tags, 55, 3,800 respectively for those two. And on the other side, don't ignore just raw good hitters like Vladdy. Um, Matt Chapman, fly ball hitter here, could be a, a decent spot. Uh, they're at normal price tags, though, so I'm not overly uh, thrilled with getting to offense. All right, let's move on to the Yankees and the Angels. Uh, last night, you kind of needed Patty Sandoval. Um, Chase Silseth, eh, probably not here tonight. Carlos Rodon going for the Yanks. He's at 8,500 here in his third start. and yeah, He's now th- seeing 30-plus percent ownership. I think we might have to be a little careful with this. However, uh, I did mention that at the same price tag, he was in play at Coors Field because Rockies are bad. Despite the fact that they play all their games at Coors Field, they are terrible against left-handed pitching. The Angels are not the Rockies. Um, you know, Obviously, the ballpark shift here plays a significant role. However, this is still just Rodon's third start, so I want to be a little bit careful with him. Um, the good news is that in his last start, he did throw 88 pitches, so he's fully stretched now. And he should be good for 90-plus uh, in pretty much all scenarios that he doesn't get absolutely blasted. So at a similar price tag here at a far better ballpark, the, the, of course the, the matchup is uh, far worse. Um, you know, in aggregate, the Angels against lefties, they've been very difficult to attack all season. 113 WRC+. plus. The strikeouts are there, but with Trout gone, we're actually losing a 30% K rate bat, uh, despite the fact that it is Mike Trout. So these power numbers are going to come off a little bit, certainly the hard contact. The fly ball numbers will drop as well. A lot of these guys from the Angels are still going to hit um, a, a few more ground balls than they will fly balls because Trout naturally is a, a very heavy fly ball hitter. So overall, the lineup is most most definitely worse, right, Um with the absence of Trout. However, it's still not an easy lineup to attack necessarily. Um, It is still very warm in L.A., and this is a hitter's ballpark down here. It plays slightly hitter-friendly, and certainly when it's very warm. At 90 degrees in in L.A., that's kind of... uh, I mean, uh, that's certainly outsized to where they normally sit temp-wise. So, um, you know, this isn't Yankee Stadium or Coors Field or anything, but I think that has to put offense in play here. So I'm going to be a little careful with Carlos Rodon. It's not that I don't think um, he is serviceable, right? He still has, you know, 25% strikeouts in the tank, but, you know, we got to see him start to exhibit that a little bit. He's got two starts now. One of them, yeah, it was at Coors Field, and his first uh, appearance in his first game back was against the Cubs. They do strike out, and he was not efficient in the raw whiff category. So um, we got to keep an eye on that. We've seen that with a couple of guys this season. One guy we'll get to in the next couple of games. After coming off of extended injuries um, or extended absences from injuries, extended injuries from absences, easy for me to say, um, there it, it takes them a little while to sort of round into form here. And I think uh, perhaps we might see a little bit of that with Carlos Rodon. So I want to be careful clicking in, you know, just field um, percentages here at 30% with Rodon. I think there's other guys in this range. There's a lot of guys that project pretty well today at 17.5 or so so with a north of 30 value score uh, here in the early going. So uh, I'm a little, you know, cautious here. I want want to be careful with this, Uh, even though I do think the price tag is, is very much playable. Obviously, we like the ballpark shift. I don't like the matchup shift. Uh, of course, because, you know, going after the Angels here, 
it, it's still really difficult. You got to get through um, some pretty okay hitters that have pretty good numbers against left-handed pitching, even though Carlos Rodon is historically a well above average lefty. I have no problems playing a little bit of him, of course, tonight. But uh, I'll probably, you know, if I build teams right now, I can almost guarantee you I'd come in under this 30% figure. I think it's just a little bit aggressive. Um, you know, overall, these guys up in this, you know, up at the top end of the spectrum, projection-wise and, and, and price-wise, uh, the matchups for them aren't all that excellent. And it's really not any different here with Rodon. So I want to be careful here and still play the sort of wait-and-see game. Um, even if he is stretched out for six, like he's probably capped at about six innings. And it, when he's only making his third start in this particular matchup, I think I need a little bit more upside to be eating this kind of ownership figure on him. So um, that's kind of where I stand with Rodon right now. Uh, perhaps I'll dig into him a little bit more throughout the day, but that's kind of where I am um, at the moment. Chase Sills says on the other on the other side of the game here for the Angels, seven thousand. I don't think he's really in play at this price tag. He's going to get called up and, and make a start. He has been starting down in the minors. Um, so these numbers here in the majors this season, nine appearances, just a one start, uh, are basically total noise. We can't really do anything with this. The pitch mix, we can you know look at a little bit of the distribution, not really the values, of course. Um, strike one is good. The walk rate, of course, is it, that's going to jump out at us. And just an 18% strikeout rate uh, when you're coming out of the bullpen, it's pretty concerning. Um, these numbers haven't really changed all that much. Don't want to go too deeply into them. Um, but he has thrown, uh, what, like 22 or so innings in the minors. Has been a starter uh, in, what, I think five starts. So they're, they're stretching him out to about four innings or so. And I think he's probably capped at about a five-inning max. And overall, if he's going to have trouble walking people, right, throwing strikes two and three, not necessarily strike one, but creating swing and miss with a low swinging strike rate sub nine percent here um 7,000 I think is, is just flat overpriced even in a pretty good matchup against the Yankees whose offense has been absolutely atrocious uh since they lost judge 91 WRC plus is kind of like suspiciously and shockingly high to be quite honest um I have no idea how they're four games above 500 this team is bad without Aaron Judge this offense is awful they're similar to the Padres they just do not hit for any batting average whatsoever when they get there they hit the baseball out and unfortunately they're not the Atlanta Braves they don't have anywhere near the capable hitters uh in aggregate that you know some of these other good offenses do so I'm you know if Chase Silseth were a little bit cheaper I'd have maybe a little bit of interest because we're not super thrilled about playing many guys down here in this range, certainly in the, in the seven K range. Um, as we get a little bit cheaper, maybe a couple guys we can consider we'll, we'll, we'll get to, I think the matchup is fine for him. If he can go five innings, could he keep the Yankees off the board here and have a serviceable 15, 18 point outing or something? Yeah, I think that could be fine as an SP two, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do this. Um, I have obviously big concerns with a low strikeout rate, high walk rate, and a very low swinging strike rate. I need guys to generate more CSW than 24, 25%, especially when you've been coming out of the bullpen. So overly, um, you know, not overly interested, I should say, with Chase Silseth here. Um, does that mean I want to get to the Yankees? I mean, like I said, they're, they're a pretty bad offense, but they're playing in the same ballpark as the Angels, and the same weather, right? So I do think they are in play. They're going to be off the board, really, um, in terms of ownership. Perhaps maybe a little bit more popular. Uh, I think we're going to see everything pretty spread out here today, ownership-wise. So uh, I'm going to have really no problems getting to some of the Yankees. We're seeing the price tags tick up a little bit. Stanton up to 46. Claver still at 49. Um, but everybody is for the most part, pretty cheap. Probably see Ozzy Peraza lead off again. I don't know. They might do something crazy up at the top. Who knows what they're going to do with the lineup as they're really still just trying to create and find offense since they've been so poor over the last you know, month and a half or so. Um, I'm fine getting to some Yankees. I'm fine getting to some Angels. I'll always show Shohei Otani. Um, since they did announce Chase Silseth, the... DK doesn't actually have Otani in the in the player pool. They are claiming that they're going to add him. Uh, I'm sure that they will do so at some point later today. So I have no idea what his price is. Even it, it's probably you know 65, 6600, whatever. Not like it matters. 
Uh, you could still play him in stacks. I'd probably not go out of my way to play him against Rodone because he's still going to strike out a lot. Rodone historically, of course, has very good uh, suppression metrics and strikeout stuff against the left side. So probably, you know, certainly not my favorite expensive guy today. Much rather play, you know, Ronald Acuna, of course. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't play Otani or anything and certainly get to a couple of off-the-board uh, angel stacks. I think it is okay if you want to just play leverage games uh, against Carlos Rodon in very high ownership. Um, you know, he might only be able to go four and a third, four and two thirds or something. And, you know, he's having trouble throwing some strike one here in the early going as well. So we got to keep an eye on that. Okay, let's move on to San Francisco and the Reds. Uh, my goodness, this game went off too. Unfortunately, we couldn't get lineups for these um, these two teams before lock because, you know, they had to finish their, their game that was uh, suspended from the day before. Um, not going to have that issue tonight. They put up, you know, you could have gotten to this game last night as well, right? It was ended up like 11-10 or something. Not much is going to change here tonight. Both of these arms still super attackable. Ross Stripling's got a 11.5% barrel rate. Now, he doesn't walk anybody, um, and he still induces some ground ball. So that would take us off of some of the Reds here at, at super expensive price tags. Like, this is Atlanta territory for these guys still. Um, 6,400 for Ellie is kind of insane. 5,700 for Matt McClain is definitely insane. Everybody else is like, okay. 45 for Friedel, 40, 51, excuse me, for Jake Fraley, 48 for Johnny India. Uh, CES came in, hit a pinch hit bomb last night at 2,500. Nice to see that from him. Tyler Stevenson, his numbers this season certainly don't warrant a 4,200 price tag. You can't really pay like a $4,200 catcher in the eight hole. Um, will Benson still cheap? So he'll make that cheaper. You know, full red stacks cheaper for you. Joey Votto's got to be my favorite uh, price adjusted play here, certainly at 4,600. I really like the batted ball spot for him, too. He's really lifting the baseball. He's one of the few hitters in baseball that has really, really embraced the shift from, you know, contact hitters on base type of guys as Joey was earlier in his career, We're walking at a 16, 17, 18 percent clip sometimes, some seasons to. The shift in more strikeouts and more fly balls in deliberately trying to lift the baseball. Joey's really um, embraced the sort of movement, and you know, the numbers certainly in, in a very short sample this season. When healthy, Joey is still uh, one of the best hitters in baseball. Um, you know, of course, at his age, you know, let's not, not, not get carried away with it. He's not Otani or anything at this point in his career, uh, but he's still a hell of a good hitter. And he's got excellent plate discipline still, and I really like this batted ball profile for him. He's, as I mentioned, trying to lift a baseball, and this is going to play pretty well against the slight ground ball lean for here for Ross Stripling. Um, he does have six pitches, Stripling, and really only two of them are good, however. So he's very much attackable, and it's mostly that barrel rate I mentioned, 11.5%. He's given up a lot of hard contact. It's loud to both sides and an aggregate 35% here. It does take me off of the Reds, however, at their price tags because he doesn't walk a lot of people. He's still efficient early in the count. And he does have a little bit of swing and miss to the left-handers. That's really how we want to get super excited with the Reds uh, against righties, of course, is with some of their lefties and Ellie, Fraley, TJ Friedel, and Joey Votto, of course. Um, you know, these are not cheap, right? Joey Votto's still 4,600 at first base. I do really like this play, though, for him tonight. Um, taking apart some Ross Stripling. I think it's a good, pretty good batted ball matchup. He's going to be able to make a lot of hard contact here. And Stripling's really giving it up in the short sample. Um, the 384 Wobo with a 324 batting average allowed to the left-handers is pretty concerning. Now, probably running a little bit cold there with just a 271 XBA, 354 X Woba. A little bit lower than the realized metrics, of course. But a 226 X ISO is still a pretty damn high figure even though um yeah i mean he's actually running a little bit hot here because the the raw bat it, or the raw average here between these two numbers even though that's kind of a crude way to look at it is uh, about 215 give or take so um you know mostly in line with the power figures that he's given up so i think this is an attackable spot for the reds and their price tags are going to keep them you know, their ownership uh way way down so i think that makes them a very viable tournament stack if you want to try and stack this game again, the Giants are super cheap on the other side, and they get Graham Ashcraft. He's 5,800. Now, I, I really want to play Graham Ashcraft, and I think we're maybe getting to an area, certainly price tag-wise, he's been this cheap before. That's that's not really it. 
it's really the the arsenal split over his last six starts he's moved a full 20 percent of the arsenal over to the two-seamer here now i wish it wouldn't be a two-seamer, right? I wish it were a four-seamer uh, or a change-up or something to induce some swing and miss. Like, I don't care if the guy's got velocity. Like, you, you need a swing and miss pitch, and it it's not going to come with the sinker, and it's not going to come with the cutter. So he's never going to be a very high upside DFS arm for us, despite good velocity at 97+. plus. Uh, he'll have outings, right, when he suppresses on occasion. I think this may be one of them. Um, I'm not super jacked about playing a, a ton of Graham Ashcraft here because the Giants still batted ball wise they're going to try and lift the baseball of course right neutral ground ball to fly ball and aggregate for him now a couple of these guys of course Jock Peterson's going to hit the baseball in the air Yastrzemski Patty Bailey Brett Wisely down at the bottom uh, Blake Sable as well they're going to try and hit the baseball in the air from the left side Michael Conforto a little bit more of a ground ball lean same with like a uh, Wilmer Flores um, and perhaps a uh, Brandon Crawford, something like that. A little bit more heavy on the ground ball, uh, batted ball profile for them. Um, so those guys won't wouldn't be my favorite. I'd like to perhaps get to maybe some short stacks here. I mean, full stacks are definitely in play because this is in Cincinnati. You can always stack every offense in Cincinnati when it's warm there because it's a very small yard. And Graham Ashcraft, not going to, excuse me, throw it past anybody. Um, he does still throw the cutter that, takes the lefties out of play a little bit for me. You know, it's not a fantastic cutter. It's not a Corbin Burns type of cutter, but it's still a pretty damn good pitch. Uh, still does induce 20% soft contact, give or take, to the left side of the plate and only gives up 21% hard contact. So that's how I'd like to come off of the Giants here. I think their ownership is going to be pretty high once again. Uh, so I don't think it's bad if you want to fade a little bit of the Giants here for ownership concerns and the fact that Ashcraft is throwing a... A pretty, a pretty good suppression pitch here in the cutter, throwing it very heavily to left-handers. Um, so still getting two ground balls per fly ball. It's not just because that Jock Peterson and, and Yastrzemski are hitting 050 and 060 ground balls per fly ball themselves. Uh, it, it's still going to be difficult to lift the baseball because you know a 20 ground ball to fly ball number for Ashcraft is still a pretty difficult number to get through. It's the line drive figure that's going to allow the Giants to succeed here and, once again, the warm weather in the small ballpark. So uh, they're very much in play, of course, but ownership concerns you have to keep an eye out. Jock is a fantastic play at 4,400. He's still hitting the baseball very hard, even though the power numbers haven't quite shown up yet this season. And Yastrzemski at 3,000 doing the same. Those two price adjusted would be my favorites from the left side of the plate. But if you want to mix in like a Wilmer Flores is a fly ball hitter and is going to see a lot of the cutter, which is not a good pitch against same handed hitters. It's going to tail over the barrel here. But we do need to keep in mind that he has once again moved a lot of this usage over to the two seamer. So um, he's going to go after right handers a little bit more with this two seamer. And he's using it, you know, pretty heavily. You know, the pitching, um, the uh sort of coaching staff over here, I, I should say, uh, for the Reds is historically and certainly in the minors very, very sharp. Um, so that they know that he needs more than just a, a cutter-slider combination, and they have deliberately forced this in. Very heavy usage. Even though it's not good so far, um, they're, they're really working with him because they want him in the rotation. They know that he has velocity and control that can play at this level. Um so they're working really hard to really balance out the power issues that he was giving up earlier in the year, and it seems to be working a little bit. These numbers starting to tick down against right-handers. Still, the susceptibility is there, so you can still get to giant stacks. Um, so that said, you know, not I, I'm not playing Ross Stripling um, pretty much at all. I might play a little bit of Graham Ashcraft here because I am intrigued with the soft contact number here or soft to hard contact ratio uh, against left-handers and the introduction of this two-seamer here against righties. Giants are still a strikeout-heavy team, right? And when they are not hitting the baseball out, they really don't hit for a lot of batting average. Just 245 here. That's you know, below average for an offense. Not a lot of power. Slightly above average. Hard contact, yeah. Um... And the ballpark really takes me off of a lot of Ashcraft. If this were in San Francisco, I'd be playing probably uh, an egregious amount, kind of a shameful amount of, of Ashcraft here. But um, I think offense is certainly in play here. Definitely the Reds as a very contrarian stack. Of course, the Giants. You can come off of them, though, and play a little bit of Ashcraft. I think that's a contrarian build tonight, and I think it's in play.
All right, let's move on. I'm yapping here a little bit. Tuki Tucson on the mound for the White Sox against Verlander in the Mets. It's City Field. Um, Mets really took apart Giolito last night. That was um, kind of surprising, to be quite honest. Can we count on the Mets to really take apart Tukey again tonight? I mean, perhaps. Uh, Tukey's got an 18% walk rate here in his six appearances this season. You know, the 51% strike one rate himself. So it's 6,900. I think that has to take it out of play for me. That's just kind of how I play. However, I do have a little bit of an inkling that with this particular arsenal, Tukey could be serviceable tonight because I still like going after the Mets, despite the fact that they are a difficult strikeout matchup. A lot of the time, I'm uh, frozen in the sheet here. There we go. Uh, you know, 21% in aggregate against righties and just a break-even creation offense. Um, this game's still in City Field, and the offense overall is still pretty pathetic for the most part. When they're not hitting the baseball over the wall, like with a Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonzo type, and really just circling the base pack, they don't create offense all that efficiently. Brandon Nimmo, he'll swipe a bag on occasion, um, as will a Starling Marte if he can get on base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Frankie... Alvarez behind the plate had a really good night last night. Um, he's going to do that. He's a high-variance catcher piece, of course. So you can still play some of the Mets. They still have plenty of pop, and their price tags are, are viable to get you there once again. As a matter of fact, in value scores, aggregate value scores,